this session they're going to make something really unique, crazy. We're going to make a Nixie tube that is really big. I mean, this is not a giant Nixie tube. This is a gargantuan Nixie tube. Um, I got here, this is going to be the envelope. It's, uh, I don't know how tall it is. Let's see. It's, it's 8 inches in diameter and 20 inches tall. That's the biggest one that I could find. There's no way that I could blow a, uh, an envelope this size with the equipment that I've got. Uh, these are molded. These, these big, this is a cloche. It's a, uh, made for like putting plants or uh, things that you don't want to get dust on. Yeah. And these are molded. They're, they're molded and they're not particularly expensive. They're uh, under $100 on eBay. And this is going to make the envelope. Now, to make a, a Nixie this big, we cannot do it in the conventional way. You know, I, I, an envelope this large would have to be, in order to support a vacuum that we, it would take to have a real Nixie tube, conventional design, would have to have glass that was a half inch thick to be safe. You know, this thing here, this is paper thin. This, this glass is, it, it measures about a sixteenth of an inch thick. It's very, very thin. So it's just decorative. You could not put a vacuum in here and expect it to hold up. If you got it pumped down, it would be a really dangerous, fun thing to like throw something at it and let it explode. And it, it would explode, literally. Implode, explode, same thing when you have that kind of pressure. Okay, now for the letters, we're going to make them in the same way that neon tubes are made. Uh, they, we cannot have the conventional design of Nixie with all, the whole envelope filled with a vacuum, uh, neon under a vacuum. There, there are a couple of different problems doing that. Even if we had a, an envelope that would take it, uh, the pressure, the problem comes from electrical problems. When you've got huge distances between the parts of the number and the, uh, and the anode, there's all kinds of problems that, that crop up. You'll have part of the electrode will light up, and if everything isn't spaced absolutely perfectly, then the, the glow will concentrate there, and you'll have to run so much current through it to uh, get it to light up the rest of the number that you, it, it would be ridiculous. The thing would turn red hot. It would be so much current. So um, that kind of a situation simply cannot be, um, cannot be done. You know, Dalibor is making some that are, oh, you know, about so big around, and he's somehow, he's getting it to where the, uh, the, the, the glow on the tube is, is spreading out evenly, so it, it should work. But trying to do it on something when you've got a number this big, this is the size of the numbers that's going to be in there. That's, uh, I think, 14 inches is what I figured. Yeah. Okay, 13 inches tall. The numbers are going to be 13 inches tall inside there. And there will be 10 of them. And um, they're going to be made out of this uh, capillary tubing. And this will be uh, filled with neon and sealed off with electrode in each end. And just exactly like neon sign. We just take it and bend the, we'll bend the tubing into the shape of the number. And at the bottom, we'll uh, just have two ends and we'll have the two electrodes and we'll, we'll go ahead and um, hide them so that they don't show up when you light, light the Nixie. And that will give us a glowing number. And we'll have the ten numbers set in there and um, it, it will work just like an, a, a real Nixie tube. Now the very bottom, see this will, the, the numbers will go to here so we'll have about uh, four inches in the bottom. And that's where the high voltage power supply will be placed. Uh, these take about 1100 volts. I, I tried a, uh, a, a 13 inch tall one, which I have somewhere. 
see if I can find it. Okay, here I have a 13-inch um, long tube, which will be similar to the number one. And um, you can see it glows really nice. Really nice glow to it. I don't know. Doesn't really look that's that's what it looks like right there. That's what it looks like. Okay. So that's the uh, glow that we get out of it. Now it takes about a for this one here alone, it takes about a thousand volts to break it down and get it to uh, get it to arc. So it's going to take some very high voltage drivers to drive the tubes. I haven't yet decided exactly which uh, scheme is going to be ideal for driving it. Uh, obviously, using uh, transistors is not going to be valid using a single power supply and transistors. Uh, there are some high voltage transistors out there uh, that'll handle oh, 1200 volts, maybe even 1500 volts, but the thousands of volts, like the number eight, requires a one meter, that's one meter of glass tubing. This is going to take on the order of 5,000 volts to break down. So, so controlling 5,000 volts uh, with a transistor itself is not going to be practical. It would take a string of them connected in series. That's getting too messy. So what I'll probably do is make individual inverters for each number. I'll have 10 inverters and the inverters will be controlled with a low voltage, say 12 volts, and then the output of the inverter will be the thousands of volts. Uh, this serves two things. The first thing, we want AC on these, on these uh, uh, tubes. We don't want to use DC to light them up. So we're going to use AC, just like in a neon sign, to light up the tube. And an inverter, a small inverter, that will put out the, the uh, 5 or 10 milliamps that it takes at the uh, 5,000 volts. Uh, this will not be much. It'll be a little small uh, inverter that uh, can be easily built, and there'll be ten of them to one for each digit. And those will be easily switchable by the 12 volts on the primary of the inverter. Okay? The first thing that I'm going to do is to make up the numbers. The, uh, the envelope is already made. Ha ha ha! I bought that. I got that. Uh, from an antique shop here in town for uh, 50 bucks. So uh, that was no problem. I just have to make sure that I don't break it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go put that somewhere out of sight so it doesn't get broken. Okay, now what we have to do is determine how long of a glass tube we need for each uh, number. I've gone ahead and laid out the numbers one to one size on the paper here just by using drafting techniques. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just bend this wire roughly to the shape That's going to be the length we need for a number two. Okay, here, a piece of glass. Okay, I got another piece here. Okay. This piece here will do good for a number two. We can get it off there easily. Okay, that's number two. Okay, that's our piece of glass for number two. Set that aside. Okay. Okay, let's just go with a, uh, a number two for the heck of it, okay? A two will be like that. And then, on this end, we're just going to seal an electrode in. On the bottom end, where we're going to put the connections, we're going to have a T, which is a fill tube, 
This would be tubing, of course. sort of more or less like this. Okay, we'll have this one being the seal for the electrode and this side tube is where we'll connect it to the vacuum system to go ahead and fill it and then we'll heat it there and, and that'll seal it off. Okay, so the, what we have to do on each piece of tube, we have to start off with a long piece of tube and we put the side tube. We go ahead and seal that side tube onto there. Now, working with tubing this small is no piece of cake. This is, it's much more difficult working with this small tubing than it is with something quarter inch or bigger. I mean, if this, <laughs> one little bit of extra heat and it seals it off. It just immediately closes up from surface tension. So we have to be very careful when we're doing these um, these side things or else we're going to ruin each piece of glass. All right, let's get that glass work done. All right, problems have cropped up. I have found that doing the glass work on this 1 8 inch tubing is too tedious. It, it's very difficult to keep the glass from collapsing when I'm do, going to make these uh, side joints. So I'm going to go ahead and increase the size of the elements, the, um, the, the numbers, to a quarter inch. This is eighth inch here, a little bit under an eighth of an inch. I'm going to increase them to a quarter inch. Quarter inch is a little bit easier glass to work with. Now the quarter inch glass, you can see, is substantially larger and easier to work with. You know, that, that we'll be able to work with that a lot easier than this little thin stuff. Okay, so I'll have to make up a new set of uh, tubes. Quarter inch is about as, as big as I can go. See, if I go and do ten, I'm going to just draw ten here. That's one, two, three, nine, and ten. See, that's still, that's going to be the thickness of the stack of numbers. So in an 8 inch in diameter, that's still going to fit. If I go much bigger than that, you know, if I try 5 sixteenths tubing, that might get so thick that we can't fit it in the, um, in the uh, diameter of the envelope. So this is about as big as we can go. So I've got to succeed at doing the glass work on this quarter inch tubing. It, it's, the smaller the tubing is, the more difficult glass work is. Okay, I did a test on the... Uh, quarter inch glass and it's completely practical to make the T connection. That's no problem at all. That's nicely made, sealed, easy to make. So we're going to use that as our design for the uh, number seal. Okay? We need to make ten of these. Okay, this one here is a number one. I made this the length for a number one. Okay, now we've got to make up the rest of them. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is get the lengths of the tubing, just like we did for the thin stuff. All right, that's a number two. Okay, so I take okay. that's for number two. All right, here's the side tubes. That was not a big deal to make those up. All right, the next thing we got to do, we have to grind the side tubes. Okay, we have the main tube like so, and a side tube is going onto it like so. So we have to we have to curve that tube so that it's going to fit against the curve. See, if we just leave it flat, we're going to have a big gap. So we've got to go ahead and curve those. To do that, we use the Dremel tool with a diamond burr in it. Okay? This burr, wherever it is, is the diameter of the glass tubing. Okay? That's the same size. So if we take it and we just grind into it, that'll give us our curve that we need.
Okay. Can you see how that is? You got you in here. Okay. Now that'll go just right up against that tubing, like that. And I'll just rub it fits perfectly. Okay. That makes it where there's less gap. It's easier to seal the glass. All right, we got to do all nine of them. Okay, <clears throat> now, that gets us all of our side tubes. Okay, next, next thing we got to do is glass work. We got to blow holes. Each of these needs a hole blown in it so that we can um, seal the side tube onto it. Okay, so we're going to blow holes in each one of these. Do that using a torch. Okay, we're going to use a different camera for that because um, because the um, I don't have a filter. I don't have a, a, a glass filter for this one. It, it filters out the uh, the glare. We go ahead and we plug the end off that we're going to be working on. And the other end, we need the hose. Now with that, I can put some pressure inside the tube. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to heat a spot up on the side of the tube and just blow a hole through it. By using the hose, I can just put some mouth pressure on it and just pop a hole. Okay? Okay. Oh. Okay, let's go to the next one. That takes care of all of the holes. Okay, now to, to put our side tubes on, we have a fixture made up here. And we put our main tube in this part. We slip it onto this mandrel. And we align it up. All right, we've got a fixture here. We have the main tube here with the side hole in it, and we have the, um, the stem, and that's fit there. We have our um, mandrel pushed all the way up. And then we have another mandrel that goes up inside, and that one is arranged to rotate so that when the glass uh, closes down on it, it, it doesn't stick to the metal. Okay? So what we're going to do, that comes out of there due to vibration. I gotta fix that. Okay, we're gonna go, go ahead and do the glass work.
Now I gotta get this to where I can get the bottom. That's not going to be too good on the camera, but you can imagine what I'm doing down in there. See how that is? Alright, that's one of them done. Alright, let's do another one. Having those mandrels in there, the glass cannot collapse when we heat it. Okay, I don't need to bother with the camera because you can't see down in there anyway. it is. Isn't that nice? Okay, see, and that's a long, long, long one. That's our number eight. Okay, this one fits good. Okay, here we have our number one. Um, we already have our glass done here. And um, we'll go ahead and seal electrodes into it, and that will be our number one. Okay. And stick it in here. Okay. First thing we have to do heat up the electrode to drive the air out of it and to uh, oxidize the tungsten. And by heating it up to red like that, all that cork that was on there from doing the welding is gone. Okay, now we'll do the tungsten. puts a layer of oxide on the tungsten to make the seal. All right, next we'll do the seal itself. Move it up in. Pinch, that seals it. Heat it up. Looks good. Okay.
is positioning it toward the electrodes right in the middle of the tube. Okay, that gets our um, two electrodes. Now we're going to bend to seven. I've got the air hose hooked on to the uh, stub here so I can put pressure inside the tube to keep it from collapsing when I bend it. I got it marked right where to bend. another 10 degrees. That looks perfect. Okay, there's our number seven. All right, here's our number one. Okay, pulling it on down. This is in tour. I usually take it down until it's uh, to about 10 microns or so. The stage down here reads, this is in, in uh, microns here. So what we're going to do now, we're going to take the torch and we're going to heat the glass to drive all the air out of it. I'm going to go ahead and put some argon into it and run current through the tube to go ahead and heat up the electrodes. I'm going to turn off the vacuum and open up the argon. Okay, that's about four tor. We've got about four tor in there right now. Okay. Putting 5,000 volts on the ends of the tube. What that's going to do is that arc glow discharge will heat those electrodes and drive the last of the air out of them. You see it changing color because it's driving air out of it. If you don't get the air out of it, then the neon glow will change color. It won't be the true orange. It'll turn kind of a purple color. So it's sort of like this instead of being that orange. The type of electrodes that you use also makes a big difference in how this tube will process. If you use the wrong metal, then, oh my goodness, you can have terrible trouble. Nickel and tungsten are the two good metals to use. They, they do the best. Using things like iron and um, aluminum or anything else, oh boy, you have trouble. All right, the pressure's not changing in it anymore, so I'm gonna go ahead and evacuate it again. Okay, I've got the vacuum turned on. Down it goes. Fifty microns. Okay, I'm gonna close it, put more argon. What I'm doing is I'm just looking for color change. As long as there's no color change, we've got all the gas out of it. But if it starts changing color, that means there's still gas and we have to cycle it like that. We drive it out into the tube, then suck it out with the pump then close it off, put fresh argon, and do it 
we do that until we don't get any color change in the tube, and then we know that um, all of the uh, the air has been driven out of the uh, electrodes. Those suckers are really hot right now. They're not quite red hot. It's got 30 milliamps. This transformer is putting 30 milliamps now. I don't have any resistors in it. And I've got the, the uh, Variac turned up all the way. So it's 30 milliamps driving down the tube. And that's uh, at 5,000 volts. I don't know what the voltage is across it right now. It's probably 1,000 volts or so. So it's just a good 5 to 10 watts being dumped into that tube. I don't see any change at all in the color. All right. We're ready to fill it with neon. Turn the pump off and open her up. Okay, that's 1.4, I want 5 torque. That's 2.5, 7, 8, 9, 3, 3.4, 3.6, 7, that's 4, 4.5, 9, 5 torque. Okay, 5 torque. Nice orange glow there. Okay, I'm going to let it sit there and bake for a minute and just see if it changes color. If it changes color, we still have air in the tube and it won't, won't be any good. It's starting to shift a little towards purple. The, the camera, I don't know how to make the camera show that. Uh, the, the, the camera is saturated where the tube is, so it's hard to tell what the color is. Okay, so I'm going to waste this bit of helium, I mean um, neon, and um, I'm just going to let this glow a little bit to drive any last air out, and we'll put a fresh charge in it and go again. All right. That should do it. Okay, let's go ahead and vacuum it. Vacuum is closed off. Open the valve. 2.5, 6, 7, 9, 3, 4, Okay, that's got beautiful orange glow. All right, we're going to seal her off. Okay. And be very careful. If I overheat it, it will suck through and it didn't blow through and ruin it. Oh no. Closed off. Now I'm going to stretch it and it is sealed off. Let's hook the voltage onto it to see if we succeeded. Ah, shit! <laughs> it turned purple! Oh no! Oh, oh, what a disappointment. That air. What I'll do is I'll cut this off and I'll seal the tube onto it and try again. Otherwise, we'll have to just make it, remake it from scratch. All right, number seven. Let's try number seven. Okay. Now, I want to test this joint for leaks first. Oh, got a leak. See that? Okay, got to reheat that one and seal it. All right, let's test it again. Okay, vacuum is on. Sucker it down. <laughs> no leaks. Okay, doke. Next thing, we'll heat the thing up. Especially want to heat this stem. Because that's where you get the, the flash of air. See, we're not using any getter in here. So it means that the glass has to be completely free of, of air. Otherwise, when we go to seal it off, it'll drive the air out and poison the, poison the neon.
that's good now. All right, let's put some argon in it and go again. There's about four, four tor of argon. We'll just let that sit there and cook. Okay, we're gonna let that cook for about five minutes. Yeah, a fellow at the sign shop, me on sign shop, said he processes his tubes for about 30 minutes to an hour. I don't know. Those test ones I made, I only processed for about a minute, and they're holding beautifully. Feed it anymore. It's up to over a thousand degrees. That is for sure got all the gas out of there. That thing's degassed. All right, let's go ahead and put some neon in it. Okay, I'm gonna it, turn it down and get the vacuum, pulling all the uh, argon out of it. We take it down to like 20 microns to make sure that we have every trace of argon out of there. Okay, valve is off, and open it up, and there's our neon. Okay, that's 1.3, 4, 2 torr, okay. I put a piece of paper, there you go. You can see the paper, see the paper? That's the color the, the glow really is. All right, I'm going to raise the pressure. Right now, we're sitting at, at two tours. I'm going to go up to five. Okay, open the valve. Okay, there's three, four. Okay, and <laughs> now, what we're measuring the pressure with here is called a baritron, and you can get these off eBay. They're around uh, fifty to hundred dollars in working order. This one goes from zero to a hundred torr, and the output scale is directly linear, um, zero to ten volts. So when it reads ten volts, then you're reading ten. I mean, a hundred um, uh, torr, and it just divides down evenly from it. These are the best way to measure vacuum. There, there's no other gauge that is as accurate and as uh, precise as these baritrons. Made by MKS Company, which is uh, probably the best uh, vacuum company, measuring company in the, in the world. And uh, the, the one that we've got measuring the main system is their Model 121, which is a, um, oh, it's just a, it's a <laughs> amazing. That sucker is good over four decades. Okay, this thing is holding solid. Okay. Holding solid. Okay, let's cut the current. See, right now, all of the leakage in the system is down in the bottom. There, there's no leakage here, we know that. And uh, the, the very top, we've got that pretty much sealed off. But down in the bottom, there is a leak. And it gradually, the system will come up. It's got O-rings, it's got valve seats, and all of those leak. And that's why when we turn this on, we see a little bit of purple here because the gas is slowly seeping back up in and the air, which is leaking in, seeps up in this end. So we see a little purple here. Whereas down at the bottom, see if you look here, we see kind of a purple color, whereas if we get here, it's pure orange. And as that air leaks in, it'll get down to that end of the tube, and it'll be uh, purple too. So the key to having it pure neon is we have to vacuum it down. We get it completely air de-aired, then we vacuum it down, 
and then we put a fresh charge of neon in it and immediately seal the tube off. We don't give it any time for that air to bleed back in there. Because right now that air is purple all the way up to about here. The only place that's still orange is way down at the uh, other end. And if we sealed it off right now, that air would, would gradually just go through the whole tube, making all of it purple, like what happened before that on the number one. Now on the number one, I got busy, and I sealed another um, stem onto it so we can um, give it another try here in a minute. I, I'm pretty much happy with it. What I'm going to do is make an attempt to seal it off. Okay, the first thing we do, we put some fresh neon into the uh, into the line. We're ready to go. Now I'm going to pump it down to nothing. I'm going to close the valve, open the neon, and get it in there glowing properly at 5 torr, and then immediately seal it off before air can leak in. Okay. Okay, power is on, and valve is off. Open the neon, and it's two, three, four, nine, there we go, at five. Okay, I'm going to seal it off right now. Okay, close it. We don't want the air to get in there. see what happened. Did we succeed? Okay. Still pumping down. Until we get down in the 20s, we still have air in it. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, voltage is on, and valve is closed. They okay, open up the neon. There we are. Okay, 0.8. One. Two. Five, five and a half. Look at that blue. I am not understanding that blue. Okay, we're seeing it stay a constant color not changing, so that indicates that we are hermetic. Okay? And the leak detector, I tested it on the leak detector and it shows no leaks. So, okay, let's go ahead and um, pump it back down. Okay, we're in the 20, 20 micron range. Okay, I'm going to close the vacuum valve, open neon. Okay, there we are. 1.16, that's 5, 2, we're going to put 5 tor. It's 3, 4, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Okay, that's just a beautiful, solid color. We don't have any purple showing up at all, so we're hermetic.
Okay. There we go. That's our number one. Okay. Okay, I need this one a little more. That'll do it. All right. We got the four on there, and we've heated it up, and um, we're down at 20 microns. So we're going to fill it up with argon first. Okay, let me hook up the voltage to, uh-oh, all right, we're not getting it. <laughs> Why don't you remember the plug to the power supply? There you go. <laughs> I was wondering what was going on here. 5,000 volts ought to be enough for any of these numbers we're doing here. You get some really long pieces of neon and you can end up with uh, having to um, have, have 7,000, 8,000 volts, but uh, that's, you know, you're talking 20 feet long. Ooh, look how red. Red. Okay, I'm going to cool it off. We don't want to See, by heating them up red hot like that, it drives out all of the air and uh, any cork, anything else that's left on there gets vaporized and carried away. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and clean it out. All right, we're down about 28 microns. Okay, I'm going to close it off. Okay, vacuum is closed off and we open up the neon valve. There we are. That's two tor. Okay, we want to go to five tor. 4.4, 5. I've got all the electrodes and stuff put into all of the blanks. So now we're ready to go on them. They're all sealed and they're tested to see that they're vacuum tight. So we're ready to go ahead and bend the numbers. Okay, to bend the numbers, I've got a table here that I made up out of plate proof wire. And I've got a ring here that I've fastened on the here that's the size around of the curve, okay? So this is made out of copper, so it's not going to melt. So I can't put this here and form it to the, uh, to the, to the paper, it'll catch fire. Um, I need some of that flame-proof paper that the glass blowers use, but I don't have time to order it. I want to do this now. It would take me a week to get it, if I was going to order the flame-proof paper. This is the bottom part, so it's going to be over here in the bottom corner. And where I've got it marked here with a uh, mark slot, I'm going to go ahead and make that curve going on top. Okay, so we'll heat this up, and we'll let it through and make that curve.
us in line. circle. So what I have to do, I have to take it right here and come around. Another easy one, number five.
Okay. Next ones we're going to do, we're going to do the nines and the sixes. All right. For those, the electrode for the top will be there. It will go around completely, and the bottom will be where we have the fill to. Oh. Okay, I just have to bring that together a little bit, okay? Yeah. 
Oh, it didn't go together. Okay, I gotta come down. Flat. Okay, I've got that. This is tough. So I gotta flatten that down. Okay, I'm just gonna eat it here and press it in place. Oh, it 
one piece. Wow. All right. We've had it pumping for half an hour at, uh, let's see, 2.5 times 10 to the minus fifth floor. And when we put neon in it, it's nice and beautiful. We just have to, we have to, we have to pump it at low vacuum. If we don't go down low, we have that purple glow that takes over. Okay, we're done. Let's go ahead and seal it off. blue and purple up here, so we're going to just let it bake a little bit, drive the last of the gas out. All right, five torque. Two, three, four, red at five torque. All right. Ooh, that's beautiful orange. Go ahead and bake out the electrodes. Right. Okay, we've got this one processed and it looks pretty darn good. Okay, that's two tour. Let me see, am I running up to three? Four? Four point ninety-three. That's good enough. Ooh, that's beautiful, beautiful. Gorgeous. Alrighty. Okay, I just vacuumed it and um, alright, got good solid color with no blue, no purple. Alright, let's go ahead and um, seal it off. the neon in. This is for good. Three, four, all right, five torque. Beautiful. the nine all processed or the six whichever so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut this off and we will seal it off It's, 
it's kind of an orange, but see how the four is a, a darker orange than the three? The three's got too little pressure in it. The pressure's too low. All right. I want it to be a good job. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna just leave one of them bad. All the rest of them are dark. All right. Now, what we're gonna do? We have to make the support for the numbers. Okay. Now, let me get a number so we can get a size. Of Okay, here we have the size of the number. That will be up in there like that. I can lay this down temporarily to get the size. Okay, so we need an inside that's going to be. Okay, can we go four inches? Okay. Four inches. I'm going to put it right there. So from the very bottom, we're going to go up, okay, three and a half inches, eight, eight and five eighths, Okay, next we need the step up, which will be eight and, what did I say, eight and five eighths. Okay, I need a piece of board, eight and five eighths. Okay, we've got the um, router mounted in the table saw. We got a, a, a fixture underneath there to hold the router so we can use the table saw as a router table. All right. Okay, that gets our edge done. Okay, we'll sand it a little bit. Okay, the next thing we have to do, we have to go from the base up three inches to a platform. Okay, that's going to be where we mount the uh, mount the numbers, and then underneath is where we're going to put the power supplies.
Alright, that's the base. Now, this will fit right down over it perfectly like that. And it'll go down on there. Oh, that's so perfect. That is so perfect. Got to put it first to make sure. Because we cannot stick out past the edge of the glass or we'll be in real trouble. Okay, these seven inches, so we'll make it seven and a half inches. Okay. Two. Okay. What I need is a quarter inch groove right there, and we're going to put the quarter inch piece of material right there. So I'll put it in the milling machine and we'll mill a slot in the wood. There's our slot. So we got a little extra one in the wrong place. What the hell was I thinking of? Oh my gosh. This has to fit in the slot. I've got to get this to where it fits into the slot. Okay, it's a little over a quarter inch, so I'm going to belt sand it. <laughs> now, the next thing, this has got lacquer on it. We've got to get rid of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just taking the lacquer off of there. Now, this is a little bit floppy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a rib here to hold it vertical. We'll go right there. See, that's going to keep it, keep it stiff from, from wobbling. This has to be black. Let me get some paint. What we're doing is we're making little pieces like this. And we stick stick that down on and then the glass tubing goes in there and we use heat glue to hold them. Okay.
is number two the wire broke off so I've got to fix that first. Just uh, see how that broke off. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to grind it a little bit and then I'm going to wrap a little piece of fine wire around there and then bring it around to the outside. Okay. See how we've we just wrap that wire around that tip, got it on the terminal, and then brought it back and wrapped it around the base here to hold it. And that'll make it to where we can do it. Otherwise, I got to cut the end off and put a new um, electrode in it. And that would be a lot of a lot of work. Okay, we're ready now that we've got the two uh, in there, we can put the seven. Total disaster. Broke. It's way down in there. Oh, I gotta take them all off. How am I gonna do that? Let me remove that support. And then we can put the four. Can go. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's just. That's just, uh, that's slicker and it's not on a doorknob, okay? We're just going to put the four there instead of the five. We'll put the four at that point. It doesn't matter. That goes on there. Two more supports to take care of the four. And that, that replaces the five with the four. Okay, I remade the five. I took the five and fixed it. I was able to just seal together the um, broken part and put a new um, uh, a new electrode on the other end, and that fixed the five. So now we've got all of the numbers mounted. I've got one that sticks out. Okay, no problem at all. Okay, so the next thing to do um, is to wire it. I'm going to put the terminals. I'm gonna, what I'm going to have is I've got to have 11 terminals. I need a common and um, 10 number terminals. Okay, so I'm going to go here. I'm still in a little bit of a state of shock. I just got back from the hardware store. This screw, you see this screw here? It's a number four screw, one inch long, brass screw, just a plain old brass wood screw. 33 cents each at the hardware store. I, can you imagine that? I mean, inflation is beyond anything imaginable. I looked up in my um, McMaster's car uh, catalog what they were back in, in um, 2000. And they were three cents each. They were three cents each. They're now 33 cents each. That's a, a factor of 11. In 10 years, they've gone up times 11. Not 11 percent, not 10 percent. In 10 years, they've gone up times 10 in price, times 11 in price. It, you know, we're, we're in for a, a heck of a rough ride here. There's 
my kitty. There's my kitty. You want to say hi to the people? Huh? You want to say hi to the people? Oh, you're running away, huh? You don't want to be in the picture? Hmm? <laughs> hey, my little baby. Okay, the next thing we got to do is wire all those damn things in. Okay, I'm going to take it in the house. I'm going to connect all the ones at the top half up, and that will be the common. And the bottom ones will have relatively short wires to each of the number terminals. By using this very fine wire, it makes it to where we're, very, we're, we're much less likely to break the terminals off. If I break them off, then I've got, to, I've got real trouble. Yeah, I just wrap. You know, just wrap it around there, like so. And trim it. Okay. And then, another one here. Okay, we come up. And we'll hit this one. Okay, that connects two of them together. See, it's fairly straightforward to do. Got all these little strings, okay? Now, I've got one here and one here, okay? I'll just cut these off. I'll come up and I'm going to go, I'm going to go over to this one first. I'm just wrapping this around there. There's no current, and since it's so fine a wire, we won't be seeing it. Okay? Now, very carefully. If I can't rescue it, um, it, it's going to be an almost impossible thing. All right, let me get the diamond uh, grinder. I have to grind a little bit of the um, glass off to get to it. I just have to get to it enough to get a, a twist of wire around it. wire sticking out just a little bit. Just cracking the glass off the base. Okay. Now I go over and I'm gonna go around it. I'm gonna go around here a couple times. And then I'm gonna go around here. This is that bonded stuff, ultraviolet glue. And I'm going to stick a dab of it on the end here to hold the wire. Okay. And then we hit it with the ultraviolet. Hardens up just like that. I mean, it's just that's the neatest stuff. You get these for they're like ten dollars each, and they, they have you know maybe 50 75 glues in them. Okay, see that'll hold that right on there. Okay, we re rescued it. I probably ought to take each one of those and, and put that stuff on there. I'm going to test it before I do that. I'll do that, but I'm going to test it first. breaks off of there, it's game over. You gotta be damn careful. This wire is if we break it, it's game over. It will be 
game over. Okay? This will be in the booth. Try again. Go way down. There you go. Okay, here we have a piece of paper cut out the exact size that fits in the base. Okay, it's going to be a tight fit. All right, we'll line our transformers up and then our trim pots. Uh, not trim pots, I'm sorry, relays. They look like trim pots. <laughs> um, and then we'll have our 120 volt transformer, little power supply for the high voltage. And then over here we'll put the um, the, the oscillator in the okay. okay we just heat glued that transformer onto there okay that is uh, fits perfectly okay we've got plenty of room over here for the um, high voltage uh, switching section Okay, we've got to have a ground. Well, hmm. There is no ground. There is no ground. So one of them goes to there. Okay, here we have the third iteration of the power supply. Okay, the first iteration was going to be the individual power supplies for each digit. Well, it turned out those little cores I could not wind the high voltage on without the marking over. So that went down the drain. Okay, the second one was an inverter using a high voltage transformer that was operating at 24 kilohertz, 20, 24, 25, somewhere around there. Well, it turns out that the capacitive coupling between the digits caused background glow. The digit that had the voltage on it would go ahead and couple through to the other digits just just through the capacitance in the air at that frequency, and it would cause it to have a kind of a ghostly glow. So you, you always had several numbers lit, and that was no good at all. Okay, so now I lowered the frequency of the inverter to 400 hertz. I had, I had another transformer here that operates at 400 hertz and puts out um, the required voltage. Okay, that works good. So we're going to go ahead and mount that transformer in here, and that's what we're going to use. And it fits right in there. I mean, I won't have to remake the board. Okay, so I'm going to get the heat glue gun going. Okay, I'm just going to put just a little bit of glue.
Okay, and you just stick that right there. Okay, and that's going to hold. That's the transformer there. The primary um, is, is the 100 volts at 400 hertz. The secondary is the um, 2500 volts. It puts out around 2500 volts at 400 hertz. Okay. Five is hooked up already. Okay, we've got six and seven. Okay, that's six and the next one's seven. Okay, so six. We can go here. Okay, that gets all of our wires hooked up. Okay, this is the first test. First test coming up. Oh, oh, oh. All right. First test of the enormous, huge Nixie. Okay, I need control voltage and power on. Oh, we got a five. All right. There's a nine, an eight, a zero, a four, a one, a seven, a two, a three, and a six. <laughs> Look at that. Woo! Man, man, that's a big one, huh? <laughs> okay, that's it. Wow. Okay, next we have to do the envelope. Got to get the envelope on it. But at least the electronics is all working. See, and these wires here will go to the control board of whatever we're going to use to make this. I'm going to make it into a single digit clock and these wires here will go to that and it'll go ahead and switch it. See these wires here use a separate 12 volt power supply from the main high voltage. That way we don't have 120 volt AC uh, connected to these wires. We, we don't have to use an isolation transformer to, um, to, to keep, uh, keep the line voltage off of the um, Arduino or whatever the heck it is. That is all right, let's take a look at what we're using for the power circuit. We're using an IR2153 FET driver. This is a self-oscillating FET driver. It, it gives you your two gate signals for, for a, uh, a uh, I don't know what you call it, a uh, totem pole uh, FET pair and it oscillates by itself like a 555. You have a resistor and a capacitor that sets the frequency. This particular device is useful up to 100 kilohertz. You can go higher than 100 kilohertz with it. It'll run at 200 kilohertz, but it will have trouble driving FET gates at that frequency. You can drive smaller FETs, but if you want to drive some you know, usefully sized ones, uh, this thing's going to have slow, uh, pretty slow uh, rise times on it. You know, it just it just doesn't at that kind of frequency. You're not going to have a very sharp waveform. So stick to 100 kilohertz and lower if you're going to use this device and expect to have good efficiency. You know where your FETs don't get scorching hot. Okay, we come in with 120 volts into a small transformer. This is just a very small transformer because all it does is supplies the power for the IC and the gate drive. So we need 100 milliamps and that's all. So we have 12 volts coming out at 100 milliamps to supply the IC. Okay, we have 1,000 microfarad 16 volts to get the ripple off of it. And then um, we have our 20K trim pot and a .47 timing components. This allows us to go from about 250 hertz up to around 2500 hertz. Um, with the variation of this 20k trim pot. Okay, we're running at 400 hertz. 
And um, now, there's another capacitor on here that's a supply capacitor. That's this one that we have 10 microfarad here. Now this capacitor has to be sized such that at whatever frequency you're operating, it will hold enough charge to charge these gates. And you don't have too much trouble when you're above about 20 kilohertz or even 10 kilohertz. You could use like a 0.1 microfarad in there. But when you start getting lower than 10 micro, uh, lower than um, uh, you know a few kilohertz, then you start having that voltage drain off of that capacitor before the uh, before the gate switch, and that can give you some trouble. That can give you some trouble. So it's better to make this capacitor a little bit larger in size than what you'd normal think. A 10 microfarad will handle down to 100 hertz operating frequency. And I, I can't imagine wanting to run this thing lower than 100 hertz. You may want to do it at 60 hertz if you're making a 60 hertz inverter, but uh, uh, even that has better solutions than this. Okay, <clears throat> we want to limit the surge current into the gates of the uh, FETs. Uh, these are effectively about a 2,000 picofarad capacitor to ground. So if you just have that hooked straight onto there and you switch it from 0 to 12 volts just like that, there's a lot of current that flows through there and that can overheat your driver. That can overheat your driver bad. So what you do is you put these 68 ohm resistors, the value is not critical, it could be anything from 20 ohms to oh, no more than 100 ohms. If you have higher frequencies, if you're above uh, 20 kilohertz, you go down in value on these. You put them down at maybe um, 22 ohms. But at 400 hertz, 68 ohms slows the edges down just right, and you have no heating of the 2153 at all. Okay? We, when you turn the fir power first on, you want to make sure both of these FETs are off. You don't want them to ever uh, be both on at once. Otherwise, your power coming in is shorted straight to ground. And what that'll do is it'll burn out your 150 ohm 5 watt resistor here. That 150 ohm 5 watt resistor is used to um, protect the circuit. Um, you, you will choose this resistor depending on what load that you're uh, driving. If you're making something that's high power, you know, maybe you're having something that's pulling 10 amps out of it, you're going to make this re resistor, it may be only 1 ohm. You may only have a 1 ohm resistor in there if you're pulling 10 amps out of there. That would give you a 10 volt drop across it, the 10 watt resistor. But we're, we're running um, only 100 milliamps out of here, so 150 ohms does very nicely to limit the current. And uh, that makes it to where, when you first turn the power on, this device here supposedly is maintaining both outputs at zero until the power comes up. That does not always hold true if you have a separate supply onto the FETs from the 2153. So if this power can come up before the IC gets its power and turns on, then you can have these two gates floating and they may be on at the same time and you'll have you a momentary short there that can um, uh, severely heat this up. You, you're going to put um, an amp through that resistor and that's, that's a hell of a lot more than 5 watts and it's going to yeah, chance. I've already blown one of them out. I've already blown one of them out. I had um, a short circuit on the output and, and blew it up. But, um, okay, normally you won't have that happen. Okay, now, when you couple the output of this onto a coil, you cannot just straight couple it. This is a, a unipolar drive. In other words, it goes from the, the, the output goes from zero volts up to whatever your supply voltage is. It's not bipolar. Okay, to drive a transformer, you must have bipolar drive. You cannot drive it unipolar like this. What you'll do is you'll saturate the transformer in one direction, and you'll only get half the output from it that you would get if you drive it in both directions. So what you want to do is capacitively couple it, and that takes it and it moves that waveform to where it's centered around zero, and it'll go to minus 50 volts and plus 50 volts instead of zero to 100 volts. And that way the transformer 
is driven in both directions and that doesn't saturate the core, keeps the core from saturating. So that capacitor always has to be in there if you're driving a uh, transformer coil from this type of a circuit, a unipolar circuit. Now if you're using a full bridge that drives in both directions, you can connect directly. It's still risky to do, but you can do it. All right. Next, we get to the output. Okay, this transformer uh, takes the 100 volts peak-to-peak uh, uh, -peak here and converts it to 2500 RMS. That's 5000 volts peak-to-peak -peak and about 2500 volts RMS. And that's what we use to drive the, uh, the numbers in the Nixie tube. And that'll, that'll drive the Nixie tube in one direction and then the opposite polarity in the other direction. So we have both electrodes in the Nixie tube um, uh, getting equal amount of wear, okay, and the uh, the current that into this transformer is limited by the combination of this 150 ohms right here and the 22 microfarad. You set the 22 microfarad so you get a good square wave here without any droop, and then you take this 150 ohms and you adjust that to where your your B plus voltage gives you whatever you need on the output. And that way, um, you can you can keep from overdriving the numbers. Um, you know, if we just took this straight onto line voltage, I mean, we could get uh, oh, 50 milliamps out of here and really cook those tubes. And we don't need to do that. They're plenty bright at 10 milliamps. So what I did was just pick the, the value of the um, the limiting resistor here to where we get 10 milliamps on the output, and that gives us enough current in the Nixie's uh, numbers to make them bright, brilliant. Okay, now. How do you switch 2,500 volts? Oh my goodness, and that's a peak voltage of over 3,000 volts. The, the, it's 2,500 RMS, and how do you switch that 3,000 volts peak voltage? Well, we had to use homemade relays, okay? And um, you can see on the other uh, part of the video there, you can see we made those, those um, relays up by hand, made 10 of them. We have one for each. Um, one for each digit, and by doing this, we gain two uh, advantages. The first is we're able to switch the 3,000 volts. The, the relay contacts open about a quarter of an inch, so that lets us uh, uh, switch reliably the 3,000 volts. Now, the other advantage we get is the circuit for the coils that drive the relay is isolated completely from this circuit here. So. Well, here we have the common in this one is hooked straight to the line. So if we hook it in, hook the line up to where this is AC hot, the, all the circuitry in here is at AC hot. And if you touch it and you're grounded, you can get a shock. Well, we don't want that in our control circuit. We don't want to have whatever's controlling our Nixie to be hot at certain times. We want it to be completely isolated so that it's always safe. So we have these relay coils are isolated from the main circuit so we don't have any connection to it and we supply a separate 12 volts from the circuit that's driving the Nixies to run these coils and then our controls uh, to a connector here that um, has those relay coils connected to it. Now the way that it's being done, let's see if I can get another piece of paper here. Okay, we have the high voltage, and we come out, one of them goes to ground, and we have all the numbers. Okay, we take the common for each number, and we connect all of them together. And then we take each lower terminal, the other terminal, and we take it, and we run it to the relay. Okay, so what this does is, see, and then we have our coils here for each relay. Now, what this does is, not only do we have the voltage drop of the tube, but we also have the gap of the relay uh, to break that 3,000 volts. So we, on the relay itself, we don't ever have the full 3,000 volts. Now, another thing that I've done to make this even more reliable, I've taken the high voltage supply and I have another relay. 
and it power in, goes through that relay, and we take each of these relays and we bore them together. And those go onto the other one. I put those backwards, dumb dumb. So all of our relays go to plus 12 volts, plus this one here that turns power to the high voltage. So when we ground one of these, the open collector circuit in other words, then that turns on the high voltage relay and it turns on the high voltage. And then when we unground the high voltage relay, not only does that terminal open, but the high voltage power supply shuts off and that makes sure we don't get an arc on the relay. And that, that, that makes it to where we can reliably switch without um, having the, any hangover from one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the digits. Okay? And that's the, basically how the thing works. And it's, it's the, the whole thing is just wired up so that we have all of the commons of the relays going to 12 volts and then um, the control, all we do is make that control to ground and it takes that and goes to the input relay and um, shuts off the, uh, or turns on or off the uh, input 120 volts. And that's, that's the basic how the whole thing is working. And this part of the circuit entirely is fitting inside the, the base of the Nixie. You know, they, the, the relay bank and all of the electronics is down inside here. So we don't have to run any high voltage or anything else out of the um, out of the Nixie. So it, okay, what we have coming out of the Nixie, we're going to have our control wires, which are completely isolated from 120 volts, and we're going to have our plus 12 volts in COM, which go to this same board. That's isolated completely from the 120 volts. Then here we have standard 120 volts to the line. You can plug it in either way because you don't care whether the circuit itself is hot or grounded. Okay, everything that's in there is closed in by the glass case so that um, you're not going to get shocked. Okay, that's how the electronics works. Okay. Well, there it is. The humongous Nixie. I mean to say, look at the size of that sucker. I mean, it is definitely big. Oh my goodness, gravy. Whew. We got our wires coming out the back. I got it hooked to a power supply now. Let me turn it on and we'll see what it looks like. Okay. Now, turn this on. 12 volts. There we go. <laughs> there is our C2. That is just totally amazing. Switch isn't hooked in order, of course. <laughs> okay, success on a project. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this into a single digit Nixie clock. I'll go ahead and make that in another video. This video is already too long. All right, that's it.